Um, but we're going to get started at 7.30, so I'd like to welcome everybody. And I'd like to start with an acknowledgement that we're on Treaty 6 land, which are the traditional lands of First Nation and Métis people. And, uh, and with that, I, I'll turn it over to you, Sukrit. Um, I'm not sure anymore if we've got one or two sets of minutes we've got to uh, adopt tonight. Three. Three. All Lucky right. three. <laughs> I apologize for not being uh, on these last couple of meetings. Um, it's been hectic going back and forth with uh, to Mississauga. And then what, sometimes when I'm home, I'm just like, you know what? I'm just, I want to, I want to relax because <laughs> things are hectic here in Mississauga. But uh, as you know, Toronto, the, that is Canada, isn't it? <laughs> Anyways, Rumor has right, it. Jay? <laughs> Um, anyways, I, uh, um, I have the meeting, uh, the, um, meeting minutes pulled up on my, on my computer. Um, it, I can share my screen and, um, and then we can quickly look over them to see if there's anything. Um, should we do that or should we sure. just sort of, why don't we do, why don't we do that? Um, okay. since it's been a couple of, I've given, I've made you a co-host. So if you want to share okay. the screen, you go ahead. Perfect. I will do that then. Uh, quickly share here. Now I got to make sure I'm typing out on the right one and showing the right one. Okay, so this is March's um, March's meeting of the uh, minutes. Uh, this is March's minutes. Um, so I'm going to quickly just scroll down here. That's all it is. <laughs> all right. Do you want to uh, do you want to make a motion? Uh, yep, I would like to make a motion uh, for, <coughs> yes, I would like to make a motion um, uh, to accept the minutes of the meeting for uh, March 14th, as posted on the OneDrive. <coughs> okay, do we have a seconder for that? I'll second them, but I, I'd like to make an amendment. Uh, okay. You've got uh, me down for what's up over Edmonton. Uh, yes. I don't do that at the meeting. I yeah. do the news from space. Yes, you are correct. Look at that. <laughs> What's up over Best Edmonton? Paying Something attention. else. I do. <laughs> yeah. Space, yes. And then I'll second. Or, then you'll second. Okay. Um, I'm going to make that here. Okay, right, so we have so, a, we have a motion from Sukrit as amended by Jeff and seconded. Are there any other um, uh, um, amendments? Or uh, corrections to minutes. Sort of I'll go back to uh, March's minutes so that everyone can look over that. Sure. All right. Uh, if you, I'll, I'll ask if. Uh, Who's a, who's all in favor? And you can just say aye if you're a member. Aye. 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 Uh, any any opposed? Aye. Carried. Perfect. All right. So that's March. Um. April. Uh. Here are the. Minutes of April's meeting. Um, that's all it is. Um, are there any errors or omissions that I have uh, that haven't been that haven't been uh, fixed yet? Hearing nobody. Uh, do we have a seconder? Bob seconds. Bob, Bob Lawrence. Bob Lawrence. Thank, you. thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, Murray, you've got uh, your hand raised. Is there a, 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 a change or? Sorry, no. That's good. Okay. Uh, hey. Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. 
Um, okay, and then the last one, last but not least, is May's meeting. Um, this is it. That's all of it. Um, if there are any errors in, or omissions, please let me know. Otherwise, I would like to make a motion to move the minutes of the meeting. Um, Abdur, I saw you. I see your oh, hands. Yeah. Sorry. So the, just one thing that's going to be Astro Imaging Corner one. Or wait, is this last time? So is this for this? This one? is this is for May. For May. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, then it's good. Okay. It's good. It was Astro Imaging Corner one nineteen. I forgot. Thank you. <laughs> and um, quickly make corrections on your next one. <laughs> can Can somebody tell me whether the uh, Eric Donovan of the University of Calgary is that spelled correctly? Magnetic sphere, or is that with an M A? Um, it's not spelled correctly. It should be. Mag, so M A G, and then it's magneto, and so so magnet, yeah. So change the I C to an O. Then it's thank you. There. there. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like a Marvel and, superhero or something. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, it's I believe um, the speaker is Plume with an E at the end, not Plum. Okay. Um, up top. Uh, third from the top. Feature presentation. Dr. Plume Renee. With an e at the end. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay. Uh, did we have a second? Um, Abdur, you were the seconder on that one, were you? Uh, yeah, I'll no? second. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Thank uh, you very any much. Further any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, stop sharing, stop sharing. There we are. Okay. And we're going to move on now to news from space. Jeff Robertson. <sighs> Jeff, I've made you a co-host. So okay. Take it away. All right. Uh, well, this is news from space for the month of May. Um, I must admit, I had a little fun with some of the stories. One I couldn't pass up. It was just so silly. Uh, but uh, Didn't have anything to do with Elon Musk, did it, by any chance? I, I did not mention Elon Musk. I sure thought about it, but because he did launch uh, 212 Starlink satellites in the month of May. I don't think a news from space would be complete without a mention of Elon Musk myself. Uh, I think you've mentioned him in every single one you've ever done. Yeah, well, it was running a little late, so I uh, uh, okay. Yeah, you know. okay. Here and It seemed bad luck had once again struck Boeing's trouble plague Starline, a spacecraft, as it was transported from its hangar to be mated with the Atlas V rocket that would carry it into orbit. As seen here, a piece came off the craft, but it turned out to be a window cover which would have been removed before flight anyway. The Starliner was stacked atop its booster May the 4th and rolled out to Launch Pad 41 on May 18th. named OFT-2, or Orbital Flight Test 2, 
lifted off May 19th carrying 500 pounds of cargo and a flight test dummy, affectionately called Rosie the Rocketeer. Rosie provided engineer's data about G-force exertion on the body during launch and will be used to measure the strain on the vehicle's four seats. After a successful launch, the capsule performed its 45-second long orbital insertion burn. There were problems during this burn when a thruster malfunctioned, but that thruster's backup fired to compensate. The Starliner met up with the International Space Station on May the 20th and began performing a series of fly-arounds, approaches, and retreats designed to showcase its rendezvous chops. This orbital dance culminated with Starliner docking with the station. The original test flight of the Starliner was in December 2019 but it ended prematurely after a series of software glitches which stranded the craft in an orbit too low to allow for an ISS rendezvous. OFT-2 was originally supposed to fly last summer, but pre-launch checks revealed 13 of the 24 oxidizer valves in Starliner's propulsion system were stuck, closed. It took eight months to identify the cause of the problem and fix it. On May 25th, Starliner separated from the ISS and began its return to Earth. Three and a half hours later, it performed its deorbit burn and began its plunge through Earth's atmosphere. After its fire re-entry, the drogue parachutes deployed, nine kilometers above the ground. This was followed by the three main parachutes, about 2.4 kilometers above the ground. Unlike the Crew Dragon, which lands on water, Starliner lands on land, using airbags which inflate less than a kilometer from touchdown. The landing occurred in the U.S. Army's White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Examination of the craft and determining the cause of the thruster failure earlier in the mission are in progress. If those inspections go well, NASA could end up certifying Starliner for crewed flight, potentially paving the way for astronaut carrying test missions to the ISS in the very near future. The MAVEN spacecraft, which has orbited Mars since 2014, went into safe mode on February 22nd, when its vital inertial measurement units began exhibiting anomalous behavior, NASA officials wrote in a May 18th update. While in safe mode, the spacecraft shut down all science and awaited instructions from its flight controllers on how to recover. In the weeks that followed, NASA managed to revive MAVEN from safe mode, but in a limited capacity. The orbiter is in a stable orbit, with its primary antenna pointed at Earth to maintain high-rate communications with its flight control team. MAVEN's inertial measurement unit, or IMU, which points the craft, seems to have failed, but the orbiter is also equipped with two star tracker cameras that can take images of stars and feed them into a stellar detection algorithm to help the spacecraft determine its orientation in space. 
The spacecraft is now switched from the IMU to star trackers exclusively to control the craft's attitude. NASA officials wrote in an update that the team is currently working to finish checkouts of an all-stellar mode to enable the spacecraft to operate. NASA launched the MAVEN mission. Its name is short for Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution Mission to study how Mars lost its surface water to become the dusty red world we see today. China's Zhurong Mars rover is adjusting to its first winter on the Red Planet. The Chinese rover has been operated in the vast basin of Utopia Planitia for 347 Martian days and has traveled almost two kilometers across the planet's surface. However, the rover is now receiving lower amounts of energy from the sun as winter takes hold in Mars's northern hemisphere. To compensate, the Zhurong engineering team has adjusted the angle of the solar panels for maximum sun exposure and reduced the working hours of the spacecraft to control its energy usage. Zhurong has an automated sleep mode which will kick in if energy levels fall below a set point, triggering hibernation until environmental conditions improve. The coldest period for the rover is expected to occur in July. But for now, the rover's work continues. A new image from Zhurong's navigation and terrain camera reveals rocks disturbed by a meteor impact. NASA's Plucky Ingenuity helicopter experienced a communication glitch that team members have blamed on dust in the atmosphere. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory reestablished contact with the miniature Mars chopper on May 5th after Ingenuity missed a scheduled call-in two days before. Initial analysis suggests high levels of dust in the atmosphere, combined with low ambient temperatures on Mars, rendered the helicopter temporarily unable to communicate with its base station, the Perseverance rover. The dust diminishes the amount of sunlight hitting the solar array, reducing Ingenuity's ability to recharge its six lithium-ion batteries, JPL representatives said. Among other issues, the helicopter briefly lost its ability to keep time properly on Mars, hence missing a scheduled check-in with Perseverance. JPL is changing how Ingenuity charges its batteries to help preserve power. The helicopter is operating far beyond its initial flight plan of five sorties, and engineers are assessing how to keep it working in the Martian winter, even though its commercially manufactured parts were not optimized to deal with deep cold. Although the internet erupted after a photograph from NASA's Curiosity rover appeared to show an alien door, no, this is not a doorway for Martians. Experts say it's a natural feature on the Martian surface. It's a very curious image, British geologist Neil Hodgson said, who has studied the geology of Mars. It looks like natural erosion to me. Curiosity snapped the image with its mass camera on May the 7th. Several clues make it clear that the subject of the image is not an actual door. For a start, it's less than three feet high. Planetary geologist Nicholas Mangold said in an email. Or this may show Martians are very small, he quipped. Other tongue-in-cheek suggestions from the internet include the idea that it is the space tomb of Jesus, a crib for E.T., or a save point for a video game. But the real answer is none of these things. Instead, what looks like a door is in fact a shallow opening in the rock that's almost certainly caused by natural forces. The Event Horizon Telescope has captured a historic first image of the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy. The Event Horizon Telescope is a global array of radio telescopes stretching across the Earth. It combines data from the several telescopes to create an Earth-sized instrument. 
The image which was taken in the light of submillimeter radio waves confirms there is a black hole in the heart of the Milky Way, and it is feeding on a trickle of hydrogen gas. The image was unveiled at the National Science Foundation News Conference held May 12th. It shows a bright ring surrounding the darkness and the telltale sign of the shadow of the black hole. In 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope made headlines when it succeeded in producing the very first image of the Event Horizon of a black hole, specifically the black hole at the center of the elliptical galaxy Messier 87. Black holes are the densest objects in the universe, and their gravity is irresistible. Not even light can escape. Scientists call this point of no return the event horizon. At the same time the EHT was performing observations of Messier 87, it was also performing observations of Sagittarius A, the name given to the Milky Way supermassive black hole. However, producing an image of Sagittarius A proved more difficult than for M87. Gas and dust in the intervening 27,000 light years between us and Sagittarius A can scatter the submillimeter waves and blur the image. Also, M87's black hole has a voracious appetite and it appears bright because it's consuming a lot of gas. The flow of material into Sagittarius A is far more feeble, meaning it is much fainter. We see only a trickle of material making it all the way to the black hole, Harvard astrophysicist Michael Johnson said during the NSF press conference. Why the accretion of gas into Sagittarius A is so slow has been a puzzle for many years, says Nobel Science laureate Andrea Getz, an astrophysicist at the University of California, Los Angeles. There's a lot of mysteries associated with the accretion flow in terms of why it's so faint, she added. Getz shared the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics for measuring the mass of Sagittarius A. Getz and her team calculated a mass that was 4.3 million times the mass of our sun. Future observations will now focus on getting sharper images to better understand the physics in the ring around the black hole, as well as how black holes affect the environment of the galaxy around it. NASA scientists have started to study 50-year-old samples of the moon's surface that were collected during the final Apollo lunar landing mission, Apollo 17. Earlier this year, scientists at NASA cracked open a lunar sample collected in 1972. The sample had sat in a freezer for decades at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston but recently made its way to the agency's Goddard Space Flight Facility in Maryland, where researchers have begun to examine it. NASA aims for this work to support future lunar sample studies that take place with its Artemis Lunar Landing Program. The lunar samples in question came from an area permanently shadowed by boulders. By doing this work, we're not just facilitating Artemis exploration, but we're facilitating future sample return and human exploration into the rest of the solar system, said Julie Mitchell, a NASA planetary scientist who leads the Artemis curation team at Johnson. Before leaving for Goddard, the samples had to be processed while staying frozen. They were handled with thick gloves in a clear box within a walk-in freezer that was kept at minus 20 degrees Celsius, similar to a sunny January day in Edmonton. Getting the Apollo 17 moon samples from NASA's site in Texas to Maryland was a process. Being able to keep samples frozen will be important for Artemis as astronauts potentially return ice samples from the moon's south pole, said a NASA statement.
On the night of May 30, 31st, the Earth passed through the remains of the shattered comet 73P Swassaman Walkman 3, also known as SW3. The comet's remnants burned up harmlessly high in the Earth's atmosphere as part of the Tau Herculean meteor shower. Prior to the date, NASA said the shards of the broken up comet could produce a meteor storm, but cautioned the chances of a storm where thousands of meteors are seen is very much a hit or miss affair. People's idea of what a meteor storm looks like varied from this. Meteor storm. This is even better than our screensaver. They would not listen, they're not listening still. Perhaps they never will. While the shower never hit meteor storm conditions, it did produce enough luminous meteors to catch the attention of people around the world. This reporter spied several bright meteors during that night. It was not the expected storm, but the Earth clearly crossed a cloud of dust from the comet. The French network of amateur astronomers of meteors, BOAM, posted on Twitter, along with a time-lapse image of the meteors. Canada appears to be getting ready to expand its outer space access and responsibilities by working on legislation that would allow legal action against crimes committed on the moon, among other space locations. The budget bill containing the proposed space law amendment for the moon was passed its first reading in the House of Commons. The amendment to Canada's criminal code called the Civil Lunar Gateway Agreement Implementation Act proposes to include Canadians in space committing an act or a mission that would be considered an indictable offense on Canadian soil. The moon's surface, the Gateway Space Station, and transportation to and from the Gateway would all fall under the proposed legislation making Canadians in these locations subject to legal action for alleged crimes. If the space law section is ratified, it would have broad implications for international crime jurisdiction in space, perhaps with a police force dedicated to maintain the right, even on the moon. Good stuff, Jeff. That's it. Um, yeah, I had to throw that crime thing in. It was, it was too good to pass up. Oh, great crack. That was hilarious. Awesome job. <laughs> Thank you. Anytime there's a Lost in Space reference, I'm all in. So good job on the, on the meteor storm. <laughs> okay. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So moving right along, um, we're going to now have another uh, sequence in the, uh, uh, the presentation from Franklin Lodi. And um, um, where are you, Franklin? There he is. How are you doing? Uh, it's been hectic. I couldn't get on for the longest time. I had to use uh, Sharon. She was able to get me in. No matter what I did, it, I couldn't get in. Well, we'd all be lost without Sharon. I will tell you that right now. So, um, Franklin. Not true. <laughs> totally true. So, uh, Franklin, now, uh, Sharon, are you, uh, are you gonna I'm, work I'm with gonna Franklin share. on this or how yeah, are we gonna that's do right. this? I, I'm gonna share my screen, but Franklin will do the talking here. Okay, let me just make you a co-host then. 
Thanks. All right, take it away. Well, I, th I, I think every uh, center of the RAC, and there are many now, uh, have a, a different way of starting, and uh, uh, everyone is unique. But in our particular case, there are some pretty uh, 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 characteristics that were established way back in 1932 when the idea in January of 1932 that uh, uh, we should have a center of the RASC in our city. And uh, uh, I can tell you right now that right from the very beginning, the, uh, the uh, uh, center had characteristics that were fairly unique. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to bring that, those out first of all. Okay, the first thing I should have, have to say that in the impetus for the formation of the center was as a result of some uh, uh, profs in the math department at the University of Alberta. And so you had essentially two people from the math department, plus a few teachers in the uh, surrounding city that had the greatest interest uh, which is interesting. You would have thought it would be physics, but no, it was the math department. Uh, we also have another characteristic that many of these individuals were long-term time uh, uh, commitment, people who had a long-term commitment to astronomy. They were just so excited by astronomy that uh, it was going to be a, a lifelong ambition to find, uh, to follow the developments that uh, were occurring on a constant basis from in the 1930s and the 40s and the 50s and so on. Another characteristic too was that the wives of these uh, and husbands of these individuals were also in a very big way involved uh, and it follows right through to today. Not female representation has always been a feature of the Edmonton Center going right back to 1932. The amateur and the professional, of course, which is shared by other centers as well, but amateurs and professionals would work hand in hand on whatever needed to be done to bring the stars to the general public and so on. Young and old were involved uh, too and supported very strongly by the University of Alberta profs that were involved, so on. Another aspect which is a little unique, but this didn't occur until the 1950s and the 60s, and that is the involvement of the city of Edmonton uh, in partnership with the Edmonton Centre members in bringing astronomy in the sky uh, to the citizens uh, of, the, of the city. Another characteristic, again, that goes right back right to the beginning was that it was an endeavour uh, that involved the entire family. There are numerous examples going right back to 1932, where the entire family was uh, involved in the process of bringing astronomy to the average person. Picnics uh, art, uh, are examples of art, uh, de astronomy depiction in art. Music was also featured. Poetry, right from the very first year what was a central part and it is today. And so those are the things that really uh, stand out to make the Edmonton Center quite unique. So when I go back to now the 1960s, this was the fruition of the observers group uh, involved in the 1950s that brought things like uh, Stardust uh, into being for the fir first time. Uh, as uh, one example. The star nights that uh, began with the uh, Saturday night opening of the University of Alberta Observatory uh, and had uh, members of the center take an active role of helping uh, people. Sharon, where are you going? <laughs> anyway, uh, but there are three things I want to bring up that really stand out uh, in the evolution of the Edmonton Center. And one is the General Assembly of the RASC. As some of you might know, if you're old enough, that the original General Assembly was called the At Home. And it was held in Toronto 
in a musky old building uh, in Toronto in the month of March, which of course is not the most pleasant time to be in Toronto, but nevertheless uh, it was. Uh, one of the things that first things that the observers group did in in, uh, uh, in the uh, late fifties and early sixties was try to uh, host a gen general assembly or at the at home and move it out of Toronto and move it out of March and move it to the long weekend in May. And so for the first time, our, the hosting of the General Assembly of the RSC was, was in, uh, outside of Ontario and in uh, the city of Edmonton. Uh, and it allowed again for, again, the family to be involved because you could arrange your uh, vacation uh, to uh, coincide with that particular uh, weekend. And another aspect of it was that uh, a lot of the General Assemblies, as you know, have a theme. And uh, of course, uh, the Edmonton Center had a, a theme for each of ours as well. The first one, uh, when we uh, moved it to the month of May, uh, was a theme called Meteorites Like Alberta Better. And of course, this coincided with the Bruderheim meteorite uh, which fell in March of that particular year. And uh, we had uh, examples of uh, photographs taken of the various multiple uh, uh, chondrites that fell uh, just north of uh, Edmonton near the Bruderheim area and so on. Uh, on another occasion, it was our pioneering heritage that was the theme. And the banquet consisted of something that would never happen today. And that is the banquet served wild meat like beaver, which was collected by uh, uh, prov provincial government uh, 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 trappers who had to call beaver, uh, pa beaver uh, colonies uh, because it was causing flooding in the surrounding area. So the main course was either Boreal's baked beaver, as we called it, uh, or whitefish. And of course, another aspect of, uh, uh, of Alberta uh, in the wild is Saskatoon berries. So we managed to collect enough Saskatoon berries from various members of the public so that we serve Saskatoon berries on uh, uh, ice cream for dessert. And, and that was uh, uh, the theme of that particular General Assembly. And another General Assembly, it was the oil boom. And it encouraged two, uh, two blue-eyed shakes, uh, Tony White and yours truly, uh, in costume, uh, promoting the hosting of another GA with a sample of oil sands for each and every uh, person at the General Assembly. So that, that was uh, uh, something that started with the Edmonton Center. Then, of course, because of the start of the state, space age and so on, and when the city of Edmonton uh, had to uh, find a uh, something to uh, celebrate the uh, arrival of Queen Elizabeth II to the city of Edmonton and so on, it was the Edmonton Center that uh, got into action and started by the, uh, an idea by Frank Page, who was a, a principal of uh, one of the junior high schools in the city of Edmonton. Uh, he brought forward the idea of uh, a, a planetarium. And so the center went behind it, promoted it, and, and went out to the various, uh, to the various uh, uh, service clubs in, in the city and got them to submit their approval of the idea of a, a planetarium, the first public planetarium in Canada. And as you all know, a member at the time, one of the uh, youth group and so on, was appointed director later on, and other members became uh, lecturers in the facility. The Quila's Planetarium had a huge influence, uh, influence on the Canadian astronomical scene, with new planetariums springing up across the country from Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, and so on. So the impact was very significant. And, uh, and then later on, as you know, the Edmonton Space Sciences Center had a similar impact, again, with a very strong representation from the Edmonton Center with uh, Doug Hube and yours truly, again, at the start 
and later by other Edmonton Center members. As an offshoot uh, from the space race, uh, which added, of course, to the interest in the skies, was our Star Nights. The Star Nights were uh, originally held at the University of Alberta Observatory, then, of course, uh, at the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium uh, in the area surrounding the uh, entrance to the thing. And uh, because of the space race, uh, I call a, uh, a phone call to uh, NASA uh, by myself, uh, found that NASA was willing to bring tr literally truckloads of exhibits that featured Mercury, Venus, and Gem and Apollo uh, uh, displays and so on. So we had to move it to the Jubilee Auditorium simply because the, the display simply uh, were not suited for a, a outdoor living uh, in front of the planetarium. But this brought in thousands of people uh, into, the, uh, into the Jubilee Auditorium and we charged a small sum, a very small sum, you know, something like 75 cents or something of that order. Uh, that was big money at that time. Uh, <laughs> and we attracted a lot more people to the Edmonton Centre and the Edmonton Centre got uh, very heavily involved and members uh, of the center build exhibits. So did uh, 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 exhibit material come from uh, Russia and from the UK. But the, the truckloads uh, from uh, NASA were, were the big attraction, to put it mildly. I, I checked around and I have not come across any indication that NASA ventured into, uh, into uh, Canada with such a volume of displays as they gave to us. So we enjoyed a very good relationship for many, many years. As a matter of fact, the, uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the leader of the technical team in Huntsville, Alabama for the Saturn V rocket was Werner von Braun. And he invited my wife and uh, Audrey, who was also part of the Edmonton Center uh, to his uh, place in, in Huntsville, Alabama. And so we had a chance to take a, a look at the development of the uh, Saturn V rocket. Unfortunately, on the weekend that we could make it there, uh, he was called to Cape Canaveral for the first uh, static test uh, firing uh, at, Cape, at the Cape. But uh, uh, it, it was still, we have the badge showing our security clearance anyway. <laughs> and I think if I remember correctly, that's also in the provincial arch archives and so on. Then I want to uh, mention that those were the three, uh, uh, three features from the, uh, the 1960s that had an incredible drawing uh, power uh, to the RSC. And uh, I think we can appreciate uh, the uniqueness of uh, each of those particular items and so on. I should note that uh, the young people that joined the center uh, uh, in the 1960s, of course, went on to some very distinguished career. Uh, I could point them out uh, if I had a pointer, but uh, many of this group here actually were involved uh, in international projects. Uh, some uh, one, uh, one of them, of course, was the director of the uh, of the, uh, uh, of the Kitt Peak Observatory in uh, Tucson, Arizona. Another one became the chief technician for the, uh, uh, for the uh, Canada, France, Hawaii telescope in Hawaii. Uh, uh, another became uh, the uh, uh, chairman of the group that decided which science projects would be allowed on the ISSS. Dick Henry would join the, uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, University Physics Department and became involved with NASA very, very quickly and so on. But we have many other people who have had a, a role to play in the, uh, uh, in the international space program and astronomy in general and so on. So I think all in all, I think we can be uh, very happy that, uh, that uh, the Edmonton Center has had a very meaningful life and, I trust it will continue to have a very meaningful life in the future. Okay?
If there are any questions. Um, oh, okay. Are there any questions for uh, for Franklin? I have to say that yours truly was a youth member of the uh, center in 1966 as well, for a couple of years anyway. Uh -huh. And it never hurt never hurt my development. Let's put it that way. Yeah, you're you're when you have youth members, there are a number of things that happen to a a, a young person. They get an education, they get educated for one, which may, may mean their school is beyond Edmonton. So they disappear for a while and then they come back. You're a good, <laughs> you're a good example of that. Uh, and others get married and of course have the obligations that are brought upon you by having uh, children and, and so on. But it's amazing how many people return. And we have uh, many members uh, uh, around the world, actually, that are members or closely follow the Edmonton Center simply because of that beginning in the 1960s. Well, that was really great, Franklin. Thank you very much. Um, so again, are there any are there any questions for Franklin about about the swinging 60s? Swing and six. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I guess we can move on then. Appreciate that. Um, our next, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, now, Ray, we, is it Weens or Wines? It's Weens, yes. Weens, yes. Yeah. So, so Ray has got a brief presentation um, on, uh, on a meteor he saw. So, Ray, go ahead. Do you need... Uh, do you need to be made a co-host? Uh, no, that's okay. I'll just tell the story. Um, sure. I was uh, traveling um, east uh, between Calvary Trail and 91st Street in November in 2008. Uh, just before 5.30, I would say maybe 5.23. And I'm not normally on the road at that point. I would have been home from my work. And, uh, but that day I was out on an errand. And so there I was traveling. And all of a sudden in the east sky, a little bit north, I would say about at 65 degrees, there was a, a bright light, uh, the size of a full moon. But it was, um, it was very intense. Uh, it was like an LED flashlight, just brilliant. And, uh, <laughs> and then it, it changed fairly quickly and it went down like a, a funnel or a trumpet, fairly narrow like this, and it went lime green. And uh, just went for a ways, maybe about 25, 30 degrees. And then it funneled out like a trumpet would, like this. And when it got funneled out, all of a sudden, uh, many red little balls came yeah. flying out towards the earth. Wow. Um, so, uh, so that was, uh, yeah, that was in 2008. I had my radio on. And uh, it was on 6.30 chat and all of a sudden the guy says, oh, our switchboard has been lighting up here. There's something that's happened out, out in the sky. And uh, then they, uh, the 5.30 news came on and they still didn't know what was going on, but uh, many people were phoning in. And I would have estimated at that point that this thing happened over Tofield. Uh, didn't know where it happened, but that sort of kind of seemed to make sense. And uh, it was so dramatic that you expected to even hear a bang or the earth shake or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just, just quite, a, quite amazing. So then I uh, drove on, on, on home, got home and told my wife about it and pretty excited. And uh, then I thought, who, who can I speak to about this? Because, uh, you know, who, who sees something like this? And I thought of a good friend that I often went out with observing uh, with my telescope with. He had a telescope. So I phoned him up. His name was Dave. And he says, oh, right. He says, I was traveling on 23rd Avenue at the same time. And he says, all the car lights, their, their brake lights went on. And, and he saw this thing in the sky. So, um, so then, you know, you turn on the news and you listen a bit more. And as the evening went along, uh, discovered that this was seen as far north as Fort McMurray and as far south as Lethbridge. So then I realized this wasn't just over Tofield, this was a lot further east. And in the subsequent time and, 
and I guess day or days, learned that it happened over Saskatchewan, I believe near the, Cal uh, the, the Alberta border. And uh, there was, it, was a, it was a meteor and fragments of this meteor actually hit the earth. Uh, it was a year in which um, there wasn't a lot of snow. So it was very dry in November. And uh, so ice had formed on the lakes. And so there was a great rush to get out there and find these fragments because uh, the snow would come and then cover it. And of course, in the spring, uh, these rocks would just fall into the lake and nobody would ever see them again. So anyway, that was a very dramatic event. I, um, I don't know what the odds are of seeing it. Like I said, I don't normally drive east at that time of day. <laughs> there I was, and uh, it's 14 years ago, and it could have happened yesterday. It's still that uh, dramatic uh, in my mind. So I, I just wanted to share that story with everyone. Hey, that's great, and I see Alistair, Bruce, Alan. Oh. <laughs> I know I've got pieces of that. I've got pieces of that meteor as well. Um, all chondritic, as I as I believe they are, and uh, that's a great story. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you did you guys see the meteor? Who got the meteor? I did. You did. Okay. Yeah, I got the lovely double. Got to see the fireball, and then I got to pick up pieces of it. Ross absolute, is holding something up. Too. Life bucket list item. Yeah, amazing. You know um, the the Bruderheim meteorite, the sixty eight pound fragment was displayed under glass in the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium in the 60s. And to these young eyes, it was about the size of a house. And uh, really, really, really something to uh, really something to see. But that's a great story, Ray. Um, all right. Now I'm going to Yeah, well done. It brings back good memories for everybody, I think. Um, I'm going to just speak for a little bit about the, uh, uh, the, the Northern Prairie Star Party um, because Rick and Susan aren't here and they asked me to make an announcement about it. So it's running from Tuesday, September 20th to Sunday, September 25th. And there's three presentations lined up for Saturday, September 24th, which are outlined in the June issue of Stardust. And there'll be two other articles in that issue, how to book a campsite at Black Nugget Lake Campground for the event dates, and ways members can participate and help out at NPSP. Um, Rick and Susan are looking for help in the form of door prizes, on-site volunteers during the event, and presenters for the Friday afternoon Astro Cafe workshop sessions. Um, please get in touch with Susan and Rick, and um, they're, their email address, I think, is on the website, but it's npsp at edmontonrasc.com. And more details and updates will be posted on the website later in the month. Um, now, uh, speaking of the uh, NPSP, we're going to hear now a musical composition from our Orla, and he calls it Star Party. So I'm going to make Orla a co-host. And Orla, it's all yours. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna just uh, see if I can share sound and then I'm gonna share screen. And hopefully you can see a screen that says star party. Yes. All right. So I'm just going to start it. Star parties are one or multiple night events that bring excited amateurs together under dark skies to share their love of stargazing. The Sky News Star Party calendar lists astronomy events across Canada for 2022 at skynews.ca forward slash star party calendar 2022 astronomy events across Canada. Here's a song that will help you celebrate the night sky. The sun is going down and the stars are shining through. 
There is not a cloud in sight and the moon is almost new. This could be a perfect night, oh, the atmosphere is still. There are no northern lights on top of this hill. So it is time to start the music. The time has come to dance the night away. It's time to look up at heaven. There is nothing that compares to the Milky Way at night When the sky is a velvet black far from the city lights When the moon is nearly new, the stars will guide your way oh, What a perfect start to the ending of the day So it is time to start the music The time has come to dance the night away. It's time to look up at heaven. While the sky is slowly turning round the northern star, we begin to contemplate where we really are. And in the stillness of the night, you can clearly hear Sighs of wonder, music to my ear So it is time to start the music The time has come to dance the night away It's time to look up at heaven Look at distant galaxies and nebulae and things We watch a comet drifting by and stars that blow smoke rings We reminisce about the things we saw the other night We talk about what we will see before the morning light So it is time to start the music the time has come to dance the night away It's time to look up at heaven Much too soon the sun comes up and the stars begin to fade We say good morning to the night and to the friends we made Tomorrow is another night, oh, I hope the sky is clear oh, Unless it's pouring down, you know I will be here And once again we'll start the music Once again we'll dance the night away And we will look up at heaven Well done. That was great. Fantastic. Really, really enjoyed that, Orla. Thank you. Um, all right. So we're going to move on now to Astro Imaging Corner with Abdur. Abdur, and where are you? Let me find you here. There you are. <clears throat> All right, take it away, my friend. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, there we go. Oh, go 
back. Awesome. So welcome to Astro Imaging Corner number 120. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, thank you to everyone who sent in some images. We got some, uh, some really nice shots in. And for anyone who might be joining us for the first time, this is the, seg this is the segment where I share images that have been sent in by RASC uh, Edmonton members. Um, so the first image of today is from Alan Hobbs. This is the Whale Galaxy. And uh, the Whale Galaxy is a barred spiral galaxy located about 30 million light years away in the constellation of Canis Penestici. Still don't know how to say that properly. Uh, it has an apparent magnitude of almost 10 and it appears edge on. And it's been nicknamed the Whale Galaxy because of its elongated, slightly triangular shape that resembles the profile of a whale. Uh, and NGC 4627 is a dwarf companion galaxy that's most likely causing the triangular shape seen above in the photo. And um, Alan imaged this using uh, a Celestron Edge HD8 with a 0.7 focal reducer and his ASI 2600 MC camera. Uh, and Alan was using a Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mount. And this is a total of uh, 10 subs of three minutes each. And Alan was using Nina to capture the exposures. So great shot, Alan. Uh, this is another one from Alan. This is the Swan or Omega Nebula. And uh, this is also known as Messier 17. And it's by some of the richest star fields in the galaxy. Uh, and it's figuring in the northern two thirds of Sagittarius. And this photo was taken at the Castillas de Gila guest house in New Mexico near Silver City on April 4th. And this is a combination of 20 subs of three minutes each. And again, Alan was using the Celstron Edge HD8 with a 0 .7, 0 0.7 focal reducer and the 2600 MC camera on the EQ6R mount. So amazing detail. And this is the butterfly cluster Messier 6. Uh, it's, it's a, a, a cluster of stars in the southern constellation of uh, Scorpius. And the name derives from the vague resemblance of its shape to a butterfly. And this was taken at the same location with the same equipment as the previous images. And this was 19 subs of one minute each. I really like the contrast between the star colors. That really bright orange star stands out quite well. And this is the Eagle Nebula from Allen. This is um, a wide field that was taken at the same location as the previous ones. And this is a total of 40 subs of 30 seconds each with the RASA 8 and the 2600 MC Pro camera. And the next image is a zoomed in version of the, of the Eagle Nebula. And this was with the Edge HD8 with the 0.7 focal reducer. And uh, that's the pillars of creation right in the center there, the famous uh, Hubble shot. And last one from Alan, this is, the, uh, this is Omega Centauri, uh, the biggest and brightest globular cluster in Earth's skies. And this is a total of uh, 10 subs of one minute each using the Edge HD8 and 2600 MC Pro camera and the 0.7 focal reducer. And this was processed in PixInsight and Photoshop. Uh, and this cluster is in the constellation of Centaurus, so it's visible from the Southern Hemisphere, but unfortunately not for us Northerners. And Alan says that astronomers have found evidence of a medium-sized black hole in the core of Omega Centauri. And uh, it's one of the largest and most massive globular clusters orbiting our Milky Way galaxy. And the intermediate mass black hole is estimated to be about 40,000 times the mass of the sun. Uh, and uh, Alan says that this may not be a globular cluster, but in fact, a captured dwarf galaxy that's been stripped of its outer stars. So I do hope to see that someday. Seems uh, like it would be an amazing view. Next, we have this image sent in by Mark. Uh, this is from the night of January 1 or 2. Uh, and this is the evening twilight with Moon, Castor, and Pollux. And this was taken uh, with a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens at ISO 1600. And this is a 1 15th of a second exposure. And you can see the Earth shine on the Moon where that uh, dark part of the Moon is being lit up by the light reflected off the Earth. And this next image shows the NLCs uh, from, this is between March 31st and June 1. And this is at the morning twilight. And you can see an NLC knot in the ring structure there. 
uh, Alan, uh, Mark says this is type S and uh, type 4C respectively. And these are two of the rare types of NLC. And this was also taken at 50 millimeters uh, at F1.8, ISO 1600 and 1 25th of a second. And for anyone who might be interested, Mark will be giving a public talk on NLCs on August 25th of this year at the Saskatchewan Summer Star Party. And it'll be focusing on the very first sightings of NLCs in Europe in 1885. So uh, this seems to be quite a recent phenomena. And as Tom commented, NLC stands for noctilescent clouds. So these are clouds that are high up in the atmosphere being lit up by the sun after dark. Thanks, Tom. And the next image here is from Dave Mussel. This is the Leo triplet of galaxies. And this was imaged using a monochrome camera and red, green, and blue filters. Uh, Dave said he omitted the luminance because the galaxy cores were a bit overexposed when using the luminance filter. And besides the galaxies M65, 66, and NGC 3628, there are numerous faint spiral and elliptical galaxies visible. And also visible are a pair of asteroids, uh, one of which will be pointed out in one of the next images. Uh, so absolutely beautiful shot and amazing signal to noise ratio on that. And here is a slightly overexposed version of the same one to show more background detail. And th this was uh, from the luminance data that Dave had captured. And it nicely reveals the tidal tail of NGC 3628, uh, which is the hamburger galaxy and the faint spiral arms of M66. So you can see the two spiral arms coming out of the left side of M66. And the tidal tail in this galaxy, uh, in the hamburger galaxy coming downwards is about 300,000 light years uh, or stretches 300,000 light years from the galaxy. And it's the result of an interaction with another galactic neighbor sometime in the past and consists of billions of hot bluish star forming regions, uh, billions of stars and star forming regions. <clears throat> And also visible in the luminance data was the faint X-ray plume that emanates from the starburst nucleus and the outer edge of the galaxy. So right underneath the Hamburger galaxy, you can see this X-ray plume. Uh, and that, that's fascinating. I'll have to look more into that as well when I get some time, but that's a fascinating object. Oh. And also just uh, below and to the left of the Hamburger galaxy, you can see a quasar, uh, WEE52, which is 10.5 billion light years away. So that's most of the way to the edge of the visible universe. Uh, so that's, that's amazing. Uh, I wonder what magnitude that is. Uh, uh, I don't know, my, maybe 19, 20, something around that. Uh, maybe Dave can let us know later. That's, yeah, amazing. Okay, and the asteroid actually is right over here. I just noticed that 2020 VF117, that's the asteroid. And then in the next image, you will see a time lapse uh, of an asteroid from this image. And you can see a couple more spiral galaxies near the bottom right of the image as well. So these are much fainter background <laughs> galaxies. So amazing shot, Dave. I'll say. And up next over here, this is a time lapse of one of the asteroids that's under galaxy if i can get that to play if i can't i'll just play the video separately so it looks like i will play the video separately if i can uh find it oh i wonder if Uh, there it is. Okay. Uh, yeah, hopefully you can still see my screen. So you can see the asteroid yep. moving up towards the galaxy right here. So I'm guessing this was taken over a period of uh, maybe a couple of hours, two, three hours or so, but you can see the movement quite well. And this would have been a very faint asteroid, I'm guessing, considering the brightness of the galaxy <clears> next <throat> to it. So great job with the time lapse. Oh. There we go. Okay, uh, and next one is the is another image from Dave Mussel. This is the Eagle Nebula, M16. And this was taken in April from a location in Southern New Mexico. And this image contains only about two hours of total integration time with 50 minutes in H alpha, 50 minutes in O3 and 20 minutes in sulfur. And the stacking and processing was done in PixInsight according to the Hubble palette uh, where red hydrogen is assigned to the red channel 
uh, a blend of sulfur and hydrogen to the green channel and oxygen to the blue channel. And this palette renders hydrogen emission areas in an amber color and oxygen in blue. And for this image, Dave was using his Explore Scientific 127ED refractor with his QHY268M camera. So another beautiful shot. And this is the legendary Horsehead Nebula. Uh, this was taken again from New Mexico in April. And this includes data from uh, 22 uh, five minute exposures uh, shot exclusively in H alpha light. And it was minimally processed in PixInsight and some noise reduction was done in Topaz Denoise AI. And as with all the images that Dave, has ta Dave takes these days, this was with the five inch Explore Scientific Refractor with a 0.7 focal reducer and the QHY268 monochrome camera with Antlia narrowband three nanometer filters. So amazing shot. And next is from Tamo, and this is the Western Veil Nebula. And uh, this is one of the images that Tom has shot with his new to him Takahashi TSA-120 refractor. And uh, this was the first target that Tom had chosen for that refractor, in part because it had been a few years since he imaged it, and in part because it fits so well in the field of view of the telescope with his QSI-683 CCD camera. Uh, without needing either a reducer or an extender. And Tom says the image is not cropped and he didn't need a field flattener either. And uh, Tom says that although if you're using a larger camera with that scope, you might end up needing one. And Tom imaged this in the wee hours of uh, the previous morning through increasingly hazy skies at Pigeon Lake uh, and in narrow band to avoid interference from the light of the bright moon five uh, and the total was about five, six minute hydrogen alpha images and eight, uh, six minute images in each of oxygen and sulfur for a total of two hours and six minutes of data. And the sub images were stacked and, <clears throat> and aligned using AstroPixel processor and then combined using star tools. So amazing shot and very, very nice detail. And this next image is from Ray. This is the Pinwheel Galaxy, Messier 101. And uh, this is a total of 14 five-minute exposures taken with the QHY268 camera through a William Optics 132 uh, refractor on an Ioptron SEM60 mount. And this was stacked in APP and processed in Lightroom. This next image is the Lion Nebula uh, in imaged in hydrogen alpha uh, in the constellation of Cepheus. And uh, Yusuf photographed this from his backyard on May 31st and June 1st. And due to the time of the year, the image is solely narrow band using an HOO blend method since uh, you can only get data in HA and O3 or Yusuf only got data in those two bands. And Yusuf said that he hopes to image this, oh image this using the silicone filter as well in the future and try another blending method. And this was a total of 16 15 minute images in hydrogen alpha for a total of four hours of data and 10 15 minute images in oxygen for a total of 2.5 hours of data. So in total, it was uh, six and a half hours of integration time. Uh, and Yusuf said that uh, he had way too much process, too much processing to do, and he never seems to have time for it. And the equipment was uh, the usual uh, that Yusuf uses right now is the Skywatcher S Spirit 120ED, Skywatcher EQ6R mount, the full frame ASI 6200 mm camera. Uh, and he was using the Astrodon uh, hydrogen alpha and O3 filters with the ZWO filter wheel. And all the, cap the capturing was done in Voyager and PhD, and uh, processing was done in Deep Sky Stacker, PixInsight, Photoshop, and Topaz Denoise AI. And this next image, which is the Cave Nebula, was taken with all of the same equipment from, uh, from Yusuf's backyard on June 2nd and 3rd. And this nebula is located in the constellation of Cepheus, and this was a total of 12 15 minute exposures in HA for three hours of data and eight 15 minutes uh, of exposures in O3 for two hours of data. So the total was about five hours of integration time. Um, and uh, this was with the same equipment as the previous one. So amazing signal to noise ratio and just beautiful detail in those dust clouds. 
the next image is one of the ones I had taken recently. Uh, so this is the Bodes and Cigar Galaxies. <clears throat> and uh, they're, they're fairly nearby, only about 12 million light years away. Uh, as far as galaxies go, that's practically in our backyard. So I was able to get some detail, even though I was imaging at 560 millimeters. And the red regions in these galaxies are the large star forming regions, very much like the nebulae in our own <clears throat> galaxy. And I was using the C11 edge in hyperstar mode uh, with my ASI 1600 monochrome camera and the ZWO filter wheel. And I took this from my Bortle five to six backyard. And in total, I had to capture 14 hours of data over multiple nights to get this image. Uh, because galaxies are one of those targets that do benefit from a dark, dark background. And this is a cropped, uh, more zoomed in view of the Bodes galaxy. Uh, and uh, some sharp-eyed uh, viewers noticed some of those, uh, those streams of dust coming up from near the core. Um, I had to make sure that wasn't a stacking artifact, so I had to pull up some more detailed images from the Hubble, and those are actually real, but I still don't know uh, uh, anything about the physics of them, so I'll be looking at that more. And at the bottom of the image, you can see Holmberg 9, which is a very, very faint irregular galaxy as well, which was nice to capture. And this is a close up of the cigar galaxy. And you can see this explosive star formation going on in the center of the galaxy. And I think the star formation in this galaxy is about 30 times greater than what we have in the, or the rate of star formation is 30 times greater than what we have in the Milky Way. Um, so I always wanted to capture the hydrogen alpha emissions coming from the center of this galaxy. So I'm uh, fairly happy I was finally able to do it. And lastly, this is um, an image I'd taken of the Lagoon and Triffid Nebula regions. And this was just with a regular camera lens. I was using a Rokinon 135 um, F2 lens <clears throat> with my unmodified Fuji XS10 camera. Um, and this was mainly to test my tracker that I'd purchased from another user here. Um, it performed beautifully. I was able to get one minute exposures and this was a total of 38 one minute exposures. So it turned out quite well with an unmodified camera for half an hour. Uh, so you don't necessarily need a telescope uh, to image uh, larger objects like this. Uh, and this is of course, towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So just uh, innumerable stars in that direction and lots of dust and gas. And this is a zoom in of the same region. And this was taken from Fairmont BC while I was camping there uh, recently. Um, and after everybody went to bed, I took out my camera and tracker from the car and uh, I just got a couple of test images. So you can see the, the bluish greenish color uh, in the top half of the Triffid Nebula and the red at the bottom. And uh, the red in the Lagoon Nebula comes from, uh, from basically the hydrogen alpha emissions, which glow red due to ionized hydrogen as it recombines with lost electrons. And the Triffid Nebula, uh, which is both an emission nebula and a reflection nebula. So the emission nebula part of it glows red. Um, and that's characteristic of ionized hydrogen and the reflection nebula uh, glows blue from the nearby hot young stars. Uh, and the Triffid gets its name from the three lobed appearance and both are about 5,000 light years away. So that's it for tonight. A huge thank you to everyone who sent in some images. And uh, I'm always thrilled to see all the work that the Edmonton Amateur Astronomy community is doing. So keep those images coming. Thank you, everyone. Back thanks to you, Tom. To, thank you, Abdur. And thanks for all your hard work and uh, in keeping this going and putting it together in such a great package. It's much appreciated by everybody. You're very welcome. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Alistair to to speak on the General Assembly now. Alistair? Okay, thank you, Tom. Oop, I need screen sharing, please. Okay. It's all yours. Okay, um, just a note, uh, oh, more than a note, uh, an announcement for uh, this year's annual uh, General Assembly of the Astronomy Society of Canada. And to note especially that there are 
uh, focused youth beginner astro sessions along with the usual advance. So it's kind of a, a three things going on at once. Uh, you, of course, you can sidestep from any one uh, to other of the sessions. It's in a couple of weeks, uh, June 24th to 27th, things kick off uh, Friday night. That's uh, night is uh, Toronto time, so it's late Friday afternoon for us, 5 p.m. And we'll start with uh, a presentation I'm really looking forward to, uh, the Siksika ceremonial approach to the sky. And afterwards, there'll be the usual wine and cheese in a virtual session. You can actually walk around, see people's uh, avatars and their names and just wander up to a group and you'll suddenly start to hear them talk and you wander away and it fades off in the background. So it's a pretty cool way of having uh, a virtual uh, wine and cheese. Uh, on Saturday, things get uh, really uh, uh, kicked off. Uh, I will uh, let you read the, each one. I won't go through it other than to say that, uh, note that there are sort of three concurrent sessions for advanced, uh, for the uh, more of the beginner, and also again, focused on the youth. So there's some uh, really uh, neat sessions there. Uh, things start off at a respectable uh, mid-morning time of 10 a.m. And uh, a note there for all the astro imagers out there, Alan Dyer will be doing a presentation on nightscapes. Uh, going into Saturday evening, one of the key talks uh, will be Dawn of a Cosmic Re Revolution. And that's uh, Canada's key role in the next decade in observatories and astrophysics. Following that, will be a social time uh, once again uh, in the Gather Town app. So there's, uh, uh, for those of us who crave uh, our, uh, our together time with uh, friends from uh, previous general assemblies and other centers, this is uh, a key uh, thing to do at the general assembly. Uh, Sunday, things uh, keep a rolling. There are uh, some neat things. Uh, the 2024 Eclipse Task Force uh, uh, is the 2024 Eclipse. It's not uh, two years away anymore. It's uh, uh, only 18 months away. Uh, it's uh, coming in pretty fast and we'll also have an eclipse uh, in October in 2023. So uh, things will uh, really ramp up eclipse wise that way if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, and then um, there will also be uh, astrophotography contest awards. So there's still time to submit your wonderful astrophotos. I expect to see every single one of those images we just saw uh, <laughs> submitted to, to the uh, contest. I am not a, a judge, I, um, but uh, all of those shots were really, really high quality. So uh, do, do consider submitting them. Uh, Sunday evening, uh, we do uh, start off with the annual general meeting, uh, which have been going a lot faster than they have in previous times, um, and then uh, followed by uh, yet another uh, keynote uh, talk, uh, Venus as a Potentially Habitable Planet by Dr. Sarah Seeger, uh, who uh, is uh, in the department at um, MIT in the States, so some uh, pretty big guns there. And then uh, that closes off with virtual observing uh, live feeds from the IPs from across Canada. Uh, and then Monday, if you're still around, there are some virtual observatory tours. Uh, so that's uh, pretty cool uh, stuff there, uh, especially Sudbury Neutrino Observatory would be uh, pretty neat. Each of those is about an hour long. So that, uh, those will be uh, pretty interesting there. So uh, wrapping it up, um, the cost uh, to members to see all of these events uh, is uh, $20 for our youth members, $15. And um, there's no need to remember what your membership number is as we did last year. Uh, so uh, it's much easier to register. Uh, I hope to see some of you there. And then finally, while I have the mic, I may as well do a little bit of announcement. Uh, coming up um, 
uh, fairly quickly in a week and a half uh, will be uh, Introduction to Stargazing, which I host along with uh, Berta Beltran. And uh, one week following that, uh, Jeff Robertson's What's Up This Month for uh, the summer months. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, again, once, uh, oh, uh, here's the website and I will be posting this on the Facebook page. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to go through that again, uh, you can, but rasc.ca will get you uh, to this page as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alistair. And uh, do appreciate it. And I, and I appreciate your continuing um, contributions to our center uh, over a long period of time and in acting as the national liaison. It's been really valuable and we all appreciate it. Well, thank you. As since you bring that up, um, my term as national representative is forced to stop at, in, in, uh, in December. So um, hopefully someone will uh, stick their hand up and become uh, the next national representative along with uh, Sharon uh, as co-national rep. Uh, it's, uh, it's always uh, interesting to see what's going on with the National Society. Oh, and by the way, I will be putting in orders for the observer's calendar uh, in a couple of days. And uh, so with any luck, uh, they, well, they've uh, turfed the previous uh, mailing company. So there is actual hope that we might get them in time for the Northern Prairie Star Party, fingers crossed. Which, thank you, Alistair. And it also reminds me that we're still looking for someone to take the position of treasurer for the coming year, uh, for the coming term, which would be a two-year term, it's obviously a very, very, very important position within the uh, within our organization. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a background in uh, in bookkeeping or um, accounting, by all means, please get a hold of me, and I'd love to talk to you about it. All right. Well, that concludes our uh, our meeting. We won't be having uh, meetings during the two summer months. Um, I wish everybody clear skies. Uh, we're in a peculiar position in Edmonton because when it's darkest, it's coldest. And when it's hottest, it's brightest. So uh, I don't know what to say about that except pray for spring and fall. Um, but we do persevere here. And I think the perseverance and our dedication ends up with a lot of uh, great results. Uh, both in observing and knowledge and uh, in the astro and astrophotography. So thank you all for your dedication. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate all of you. And we will see you, uh, we'll see you in September. Tom, I've got a question. Yes. Of Alistair. I was just wondering if he knew anything about the poster sessions at the GA. Uh, not uh, particularly, um, other than uh, they they do exist, and one of the sessions will be um, I, a sort of rapid fire. Uh, you get sort of three minutes to talk about your poster, um, but the posters I assume will be available virtually. Okay. And I do also want to say because there was a question of whether we're going to do it in person. The, uh, the executive committee does uh, is going to meet because council doesn't meet during the uh, during the summer months. <clears throat> it's, we're going to evaluate the situation in August, see whether it's a, it's a green light for September or we're going to hold off until October. It's hard to say. Um, and if uh, if any of you have any thoughts about that, why don't you drop me a line? We'd be I'd be interested in hearing from the members about whether they would be prepared themselves to go to an in person meeting. Um, given the fact that, you know, I mean, the virus didn't get the memo, um, keep that in mind. But again, things are opening up. So I saw that the Boeing dummy had a mask. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Masks are, uh, are still a thing. And, uh, and, and bless everybody who still wears them. That's all I can say. All right. So I will say good night. It's been a great. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. Clear skies, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night everyone. Good night. Have a great summer. Everyone. Take care, everyone. Have a good summer. Good night. Good night.